I think you need to be a player at a very, very high level. And just the, the level of playing has gotten so high. You need to know that there are people who are so devoted to this and working so hard that your playing has to be a super high level. So if you want to have a chance for success at it, you know, I think you need to hone all the other skills that are gonna go around your playing. Joe, this is great to have you here because our audience really needs to hear how you run your life in the music industry. You are doing so many things at such a high level and you're balancing all these different, you're spinning these plates and you're making them all work. So I want them to hear what you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us here. Let's just talk about where music ended your life, right? when you were younger and how you got involved with just the, the, the love for music. Absolutely. I, I didn't come from really a musical family. Uh, great upbringing, beautiful. My parents, uh, you, you know. Yeah. One day I was, you know, the, the cool kids had band names written on their notebooks. And in the seventh grade, I put on the radio. I finally talked my mom into getting me a radio. I put it on and I started hearing the music and would press record on the cassette recorder in the, in the radio so I could capture the songs. <laughs> the first couple of days, I, I happened to capture a Rush song, uh, which I remember it was the song Subdivisions, and a Van Halen song, which was Dance the Night Away with the cowbell intro. Yes. And um, something inside of me just said, I want to play the drums. So I told my parents I wanted to play the drums. Uh, they had no musical background. My, my mom and dad being practical, parents said, you should take lessons. And if you take lessons for a couple, you know, like a month or two, and you do well with the lessons and you practice and stick with it, then maybe we'll get you some drums. So I did that and I went for lessons. Locally in my town, my first teacher, and you know, as we both are very passionate now about teaching. Yeah. My first teacher was not like that. It was just an you know, sort of older gentleman said, hey, Sonny, here's how you hold the sticks. He didn't ask me if I was lefty or righty. I'm, I'm lefty, he didn't ask me. And uh, had me playing traditional and, you know, but I still practiced. I was a very respectful young man, you know, child. Uh, I stuck with it and I got the drums. And I, I was, Neil Peart was my hero from the time I was very young. And I listened to Rush and I, I worshiped their music. But I also liked all the groove music of the day. So I split, I, I tried to play the hard stuff, but I spent an equal amount of time playing along to, you know, ACDC and ZZ Top and straight rock music. I, I didn't get exposed to jazz until later. And later in life, I was, you know, thankful that I didn't spend all my time, you know, just, I would play, as long as I liked the song, yeah. I would practice that song. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that was the beginning of the journey. And then once I got the drum set, it was basically all over. I mean, I, I, played, I played my drums probably for about seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade for probably about three to four hours minimum every day. And I would do that regardless of how much homework I had, you know, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I mean, I got good grades, but I, I, I was like, look, they had me for eight hours. Now I want to do this, you know. I definitely, you know, put in my, uh, you know, my 10,000 hours or whatever. But it was, it was pretty much every day and I was in love with the drums and that's basically how it started. So you're studying privately, you're working with some local teachers. And then you kind of went to college for an architecture degree. That's correct. I had a couple of drum teachers, and then I had one that I really liked. His name was Tim Soluk. He's still, I just uh, re-hooked up with him. I was in Houston with my group, the doo Project. He was really good. He was the first one that cared about me and, and got me engaged. Then he moved away when I was a freshman in high school. So when I was in high school, I did everything. I didn't have a private teacher anymore, but I was playing my records, and I had a really great band program. I did marching band, jazz band, and then I had my rock band. We played everything. They, they said, we're going to have a bake sale to raise money for your class. I was like, you definitely need a band for that. <laughs> you know? Then they brought me down to the uh, chorus room one day, and they said, you know, we need a drummer for the school musical. And I said, what's a musical? <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of work on Broadway, but I, I, I did that, and I thought it was fun. I didn't have any goal of playing on Broadway. I was just like, wow, this is really cool. So I, was, I knew I wanted to be a drummer. Didn't know anyone who did this for a living. Yeah. Um, it was before I had met you. And so my dad said, that's great, that's your dream. And if you want to pursue your dream at some level, that's good. But you need a fallback plan. And so I chose architecture as my fallback plan, not knowing that it's actually just as bad, if not worse, <laughs> just <laughs> to get a job doing that than, <clears throat> than doing music. So I went to the New Jersey Institute of Technology, which was a local school, very good school. But I, went, I picked it because I could commute there and play my drums at night. And so right out of high school, I joined bands, 
playing in all the clubs here in New York, you know, CBGB's, Limelight, yeah. playing a battle of the bands one day, a gentleman came up to me, he was Al Marinaro, our mutual friend who was at Tama Drums at the time, and said, you should take lessons from my friend Dom Famularo. So, as you know, I came into your <laughs> orbit at that time. People were dropping out of architecture school, they couldn't handle the workload. Yeah. And then my dad took me out, I met you in Long Island at, at the drum center, we had lessons, and, uh, and then you started me on the program where I was now practicing mm -hmm. three, four hours a day. Yeah playing in a band, doing the high school marching band at my old alma mater for some extra money. Uh, and then I would be planning ahead, like oh, I, I have an English lit paper due in two weeks, but I have a gig the night before, a lesson. I couldn't, I had to, you know, start, the plates started to spin at that point. Yeah. And I had to plan everything out. I built my models and, you know, so I got all the work done and I wanted to complete my education, but it took a lot of multitasking. So you were working at the intensity of keeping your school grades the way they were so you can have that degree. And you're playing with the band, you're practicing, you're putting the time into, so you started to really develop the skills that you're using very well now. Mm -hmm. That is that multitasking, make it all happen. Right. We start studying, we're working on it. You were a fantastic student. Whatever I threw at you, you just took it up and wanted more. So I kept on throwing more at you. And then we also hooked up with Al Miller, who was a very, very fine you know, rudimental and, and reading teacher. Right. And while you were studying with me, I said, I want you to go to my teacher, Al Miller, because while he's still here, that's a skill that I think you're really gonna be able to use in the future. And so you'd come to the lesson with myself, we'd mm -hmm. spend several hours there, then you'd drive further out on Long Island, go to Al Miller and take those lessons with him, then you'd drive back to New Jersey. So you were really putting the time and the hours into it, and, and there was some serious dedication there. Yeah, it's funny, you know, in, in life you remember smells and sights and, and I, I can remember driving on the Belt Parkway listening to the Rush album Presto which had just come out in this monsoon and and I got to get to Dom's for the lesson because he's going to be away you were touring and you, you know you'd have a lesson and then I knew you were going to be in China and I wouldn't see you for a month and I, I it's just one of those you know I have these like uh, images that I carry around inside and I, I remember specific days Al was just fantastic because you knew that not having gone to school for music, mm -hmm. Al took me through a lot of reading, theoretical stuff. Yeah. And you know, I just have to say, in addition to all the mentoring and the business you gave me and the playing, which I really have to say I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for that. That's nice. So I need to document that. <laughs> and you taught me about all this stuff. And you, at some point I was like, he thinks I can do this. <laughs> and that was like a huge, yeah. you know, inspired me on a, on a super high level. And then I realized you were teaching me about the business. And you also oh, were like, yeah, and when you're teaching, this is what you're going to do. And I was like, oh, this is what we do. We teach. We share. We're yeah. like a family. Yeah. I never even thought of it. I was like, I, I mean, I don't maybe I like teaching. I never really gave it any thought. And then I tried it, and I loved it. Yeah. And Al took me through his books, yeah. which I think were amazingly well put together. Yeah, and I'd be like, oh, One through six. Yeah, right. Because that's all the books, yeah. Right. Al would be taking me through that stuff. And... At the time, I didn't realize, like, you know, it was different than your lessons. It would be like, play the page, and I would play the page, and I could clearly do it. I had practiced it, but he'd maybe play the whole page. Yeah. And then he would have me read down buddy charts. But specifically his stuff, what I got, when I, what I finally realized was he was teaching me a, a methodology yeah. and a curriculum. And between the two of you, I was, I was being not only taught to play, but taught, you know, things that I could share and a system. And it wasn't until I started teaching and getting students from other teachers who weren't organized, who just had a book with stuff written down, yeah. that I realized I was being taught a philosophy of teaching and taught a way to do it, which enabled me to, to you know, some people just do that for extra money. Yeah. And then from studying with you, because you were su such an inspiration to me and because you helped me so much, I, I wanted to give that to my students. Mm -hmm. And so you're confronted with someone who walks through the door and they never touch the drums. It's on you yeah. if they're going to pick it up or not. So I, I took that very seriously. And of course, I may be jumping ahead here, but you also told me to go to industry events like PASIC and Absolutely. like NAM. Once I got there, after I got over the feeling of being totally inadequate and overwhelmed, <laughs> which, which you need to go through. Absolutely, absolutely. Then I, I started to walk around and like see all these books and see all these clinics and you know, gather up all this information. And that really opened my eyes. So it was the things you taught me and the things that you told me to do that you knew would, you know, give me more information and complete, not, not complete, but, you know, give me a better idea of what was possibly going to happen to me. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, I wanted to, and I had many talks with Al Miller about we saw great potential in you. And we had these talks about 
about the future of where drumming would go, you got to invest into the next generation to give them the clarity so they can see the bigger picture. Not only a curriculum-based educational program, but then going to the industry events so you can see what our industry is like. Mm -hmm. Because at certain points, if and when you did get endorsements, you got to have to know these companies. So going to the NAM show, which is the National Association of Music Merchants, which happens in January of a year, the biggest you know, facility that is open up to the entire music industry, and then PAS, the Percussive Arts Society mm -hmm. International Convention, which happens in November, that was important because that was like a NAM show, but NAM show was for all instruments. Right. PAS is just for drums. Mm -hmm. So these were two events that I wanted you to go to because I knew once you were there, you were going to get bitten by the bug. Right. Once you were bitten by the bug, you already had the skills. It, that was the the last part of the fuel of that rocket that was set off that I said, here goes the Perkamini rocket. And it, the rocket's still flying high. So well, for thank sure. you. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like I'm flapping my arms. But, uh, you know, those things, and I, I just had some talks with my students about those things too. Uh, at, at PASIC, you see drum clinics and you have access to those people. At NAM, it's more like you're just getting washed over by this whole yeah. insanity of the industry. And you, you walk out on the, to the Hilton and it's like every, thousands of people uh, trying to get up to the bar to get a drink, but they're networking. Yeah. And some of them are wannabe rock stars and some of them are industry executives. And I just want to circle back. A lot of the things that I got out of my education, you know, like you being sort of a guy who's interested in different things yeah. in life. You know, I, I love drumming. It's the thing I always wanted to do for my living. Yeah. It's the thing I probably love most in life, but I also love a lot of other things in life. Yeah. And having that well-rounded education, you know, some of the other things that I do now, I have literally no training to do them. <laughs> I learned them on the job, yeah. but from having a well-rounded education, you know, I was able to uh, use those skills within the industry because the industry needs more than just people to play. Yeah. I mean, there's a full industry out there. Right. But let's talk about the playing part for a second. Yeah. You had Forefront happening, which I love the band, which was a, you. You know, a, a, a Rush tribute band, right? Right out of high school, I had a, a band called Eternal Vision. We got pretty close to getting a record deal. That's yeah. when I met you. Yeah. And then I, you said, you know, look, good luck. That, you know, I hope to God that it happens for you, but you should start working. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so I started just doing gigs, club dates and things. Yeah. And I joined a, a Rush tribute band. And I just have to say, because I said how much I love Neil, <laughs> I always like look down my nose like, oh, losers playing in a freaking tribute band. Oh, that's just <laughs> losers. And I, I got in another band with Zach. And we're, I'm talking about Zach Rizvi, yeah. who became my partner in the band Forefront. We have four records out. They're still out there everywhere. I'm, yeah. If someone asks me, what do you sound like as a drummer, Joe? I, you know, I tell them to go listen to Forefront. Yeah. Zach is currently in the band Kansas. Yeah. It was his favorite band growing up. Great guitar player and He's writer. one Fantastic. of the best musicians I've ever met, bar yeah. none. Yeah. Kansas was and Rush were his favorite bands, and he is uh, Kerry Livgren, and his dream came true. And we were in a band together that was not the Rush tribute band, and I went down to see him play on Bleecker Street here in New York, where a lot of great drummers played. So I, I saw the Rush tribute band, and I just, you know, they just sounded so great. And then Zach said, you know, hey, man, if we ever need a drummer, would, you know, would you, uh, would you want to do it? And I had rebelled against Rush a little bit when I started studying with you because I had the Neil Blinders on and you opened up my eyes to all these other greats. And I actually got to the point where I was like, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, forget Neil. And I stopped listening to them. And when I saw the, this band, I, it came flooding back how much I really did love it. Yeah. A week later, he called, Zach called me, said, we just fired our drummer. Can you come down Wednesday night and play with us at, at, you know, on Bleecker Street? I went down no rehearsal and played my first gig with Power Windows. That was the name of our Rush cover band. That lasted 11 years. And during that time, Zach and I started the band Forefront. Right. And that, that's sort of my band, you know, sort of where I guess I'm one of the architects of how it sounds. And that kind of gave me, a, I guess you'd say, a little bit of a uh, reputation in the progressive rock world. Absolutely. And what's <laughs> interesting about it is that you, you stayed with it. You sounded great. I came to hear the band several times. And you really, you really drove it in a complimentary way to Neil, but you had your own sound and you were pushing your own style, which I love the fact that your personality was still coming out with the band. That was fantastic. Thank you. Then where did Happy the Man come in? So Happy the Man came in a little later. For, for those who don't know, they, they were kind of a cult, pretty, pretty big deal cult band. Absolutely. And when I found out about that, I actually didn't really know about them. I had started subbing my first Broadway show, which was Moving Out which was the Billy Joel show. I was chubbing, subbing for the great Chuck Berge on the show. Yeah. 
they had approached Chuck to audition for Happy the Man. Chuck's a little bit older than me. Dave Rosenthal, who's Billy Joel's uh, synthesizer keyboard player, was already in Happy the Man. And he was this, one of the supervisors musically at Moving Out. And so he invited Chuck to yeah. audition. Chuck said, I can't, but my sub, Joe, would be great for the band. And what happened was Chuck knew Forefront. He had the CD, he gave it to Dave, and Dave said, oh, yeah, we should try this guy out. So I auditioned for Happy the Man, and I got the gig. But the way that happened and the way I became a sub for Chuck was I was at the NAMM show, and all th you know all, all these things like you can have a goal in this business and in this life, but there, there's there's sort of like a this whole series of like intertwining events that happen, and you just have to put yourself out there mm -hmm. and allow like you got to jump in the river, and then the river's gonna you know there's all these forks and paths. The key thing is that you work on what you have, so it's at the highest quality you can have, and then you then you go out there. Right. And then the stuff's gonna come at you and you have to decide. So I'm at the NAMM show, one of my old bands, when it, when it was you know, trying to get a record deal, we went to an entertainment attorney, Ron Beanstock, who's a friend of ours still, yeah. and I was the only one that paid attention. So I started <laughs> learning about, the drummers all, we pay attention. <laughs> Don't the drummers like, we, like run the bands a lot, it seems like to me. Absolutely. So Ron and I got a friendship and he had called me to play some gigs with him and at the time he was doing like in my mind like his clients were Rod Morgenstein, Chuck Berge, Liberty DeVito, Jonathan Mover, Will Calhoun, my heroes. Absolutely. And Ron is a great bass player. Great, terrific yeah. bass player and he called me to play some gigs. I couldn't do them and I was just livid because I just wanted, I was like oh this is, I get into the upper echelon and play with all Ron's people you know. So finally he called me, I was at the NAMM show and I was like Ron you called me that one time I couldn't do, you never called me again, please call me again and he called me again and it was for just a local gig at a cafe in his town playing some standards with a keyboard player who I never heard of who, who I'm sure if Ron sees this he'll remind me he was great <laughs> and for not very much money just to, to play and I was like well I mean that's kind of what I envisioned but uh but yeah I should I should go down there and do it right. because you know he I said call me and now he's calling me and let me go down there and do it I went down there that night did that gig and I was pushing forefront and just trying to work it and it was so hard you know because progressive rock is just to get that band working Ron said you should you know maybe do some other work besides that maybe work on Broadway and I said well that's great I don't know anybody on Broadway I don't even know if I'm qualified to work on Broadway he said well actually I just had lunch with Chuck Berge and he needs to find a sub for moving out so why don't you call the office tomorrow and I'll you know put you in touch with him so he did that and basically, I went through an audition process and I got the gig. Two things that I, I want to say about it, just for learning, you know, people, who, my students who I tell about this, they said, you couldn't use charts on that gig and there was no conductor. So it wasn't a good introduction to Broadway. I'm sure we'll circle back to Broadway later. Yes, but, we will. So you had to memorize the gig and they said, we really want you to play it just like Chuck. I had just been in a Rush cover band for 10 years. <laughs> so I was, that to me, that meant learn every fill, note for note. And that's what I did. Yeah. At the auditions, I noticed that not everyone did that. I don't know if that helped me. I, I think it did. I'm sure it did. Absolutely. Um, you need to know your job. I mean, I love to make up my own fills. I love to change them from night to night. I love to do all that. But you need to know when and where to do certain things. And when you're subbing a Broadway show, that's not a time to do those <laughs> things. So I did that. And then the other thing was I gave him a Forefront CD. He didn't know me. Yeah. And I found out later... You know, he and Chuck spent a lot of time with me hearing me play the show, and he didn't really know me. And I found out that, you know, 40 or 50 drummers had called him at least to try out, and then they auditioned at least 15 of them. And I said, Chuck, you know what? You spent time with me at my house. Like, I know you didn't do that for everyone else. What, why did you do it for me? And he said, of those 50 people, only about four people gave me a recording if I didn't know them. <laughs> and you were one of them. And yeah. as soon as I listened to that recording, I was like, this is my guy. Nice. So, so, that's also why I was in Chuck's mind for that style of music. Uh, and then I went and did the Happy the Man audition, and it was, it was very challenging music. Unfortunately, we made one record, we did a short tour. Um, it didn't last very long, there was some tension within the group. I did a record called The Muse Awakens, and there's some live stuff that's in the can that I just heard recently again, uh, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, wow, I wonder if I can still play that. That's pretty hard. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds great. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, Rod Morgenstein and, and Mike Portnoy, the year after that at NAMM, just randomly walked up to me and said, man, we heard the Happy record, and you sound great. I was like, <laughs> 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 yeah, it was, just, it was just great. Those are two big guns in the oh, industry. Oh, man, so. it was just so great. I hope that Zach and I can do another Forefront record at some point. You know, I want to, 
get back to that stuff. Yeah, with all that you're balancing, that's just another part of the, of, the, of the goals that you have, and that'll happen absolutely in the course of time. So now, talk about the Broadway thing now. So okay. now Broadway has developed to a higher level of mm -hmm. what you're doing consistently now, subbing for many, many shows. Mm -hmm. I've subbed about 15 different Broadway shows, and I learned it just kind of on the job. Uh, I started, as I said, with moving out, yeah. got that one up and running, did the sub for Chuck on Broadway, and then I shared the first national tour with the great drummer Mike Sorrentino, who is also your student. Absolutely. And uh, Mike and I still to this day have just a beautiful relationship. We, took, First of all, we negotiated to share this tour with the producers. We didn't know that you don't do this. It's just not really <laughs> done. Uh, and we worked out a thing where they would fly us back and forth. We looked at the calendar and we split it up. And it was perfect. I had started a family and I didn't want to be away more than one week a month. Yeah. And so we, we worked it out. And it was just, again, not, not common that, yeah. that you could, you know, we shared this work. And so to this day, Mike and I have each other's back in a way that I don't feel with very many other musicians. But you, know, but listen, you and Mike are great players. So, so you know, and, and Mike is a phenomenal, mm -hmm. you know, reads well and plays good old style. So there's a real commonality in you guys with your ability. So that worked out very, very well to be able to split that gig that way. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Wade Preston, the, uh, one of the piano men at Moving Out said, you know, when Mike plays with the band, it feels like he's giving the band a hug. So that was a great way to, you <laughs> know, great. just beautiful. Yeah. And then I did that gig and the guys and girls there, like happens if you do a good job, they said, hey, you know, they could use a sub at Jersey Boys. So I called the guy at Jersey Boys and it took probably six months I had forgotten about it and he called me, he's still interested in learning the book. I went down there and, and got, they make videos now, the conductors, yeah. been, not now, they've been doing it for a while. And I said, wow, conductor, yeah. Hmm. I haven't followed a conductor since I was in high school. So then that became the challenge with Jersey Boys. I studied the conductor video mm -hmm. and I got, got in there and I did that show for 11 years. That, that's a pretty special one because my band now, The doo Project, that, that I've been with for a while, uh, a bunch of the guys from that, the show are in that band. Yeah, absolutely. Then shortly after I got settled there, saxophone player at um, Moving Out said, you know, I have, I'm involved with an off-Broadway show. It's called In the Heights. It's a mixture of some pop and, and rap music um, with a lot of Afro-Cuban music. Yeah. And the drummer, I said, who's the drummer? So this guy named Andres Ferrero. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, uh, I'll come check it out. I went down, it was off-Broadway, Alex Lacamoire conducting. And I, <clears throat> I watched the book through all our studies. You know, I had worked on all these different styles. And I, I always loved Afro-Cuban music and Latin music, but I, I was a little, be honest, afraid of it. Just uh, you know, I didn't grow up with that music, and uh, so I watched Andres play, and he's playing left foot clave, and he's a virtuoso. And I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, so you know, what do you think? You want to learn the book? I mean, and I was like, this is New York City. Surely, you have someone more qualified than an Italian kid from Jersey to play this. I mean, he was like, no, no, you were recommended by Raúl Agraz, the trumpet player at. I was like, yeah, I played a rock show with Raúl. Raúl played with Tito Puente. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, Andres had a lot of faith in me, and I just worked on it and I fell in love with the music and I went in there and, and that worked out. And uh, In the Heights was a really challenging book and then that gave me a little more confidence. Yeah. And then from there, you know, it, it just built and I would approach different people depending on if I felt like I might be right for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was able to sub for Tommy Igo at The Lion King, uh, for Clint DeGannon at uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and at Beautiful. Uh, Gary Selickson at uh, School of Rock, who yeah. I'm still doing that show. Yeah. Spider-Man for John Epcar. Rock of Ages for John Weber. That yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that show I loved. I played a lot and made a lot of great friends there. Well, all of them, really. Uh, Larry Lelly at Million Dollar Quartet. Uh, I did Bring It On for Andres. After all, you know, a few years of doing it, I got my own show. Uh, it, was, it, it was called Getting the Band Back Together. Uh, and I got to finally make, my, make up my own drum book. Absolutely. It was with Sonny Palladino as musical director. I had been playing with Sonny in the doo project. He brought me into the show. Like I said before, subbing, you need to replicate the person you're subbing for. Right. Now I got a chance to come in and uh, some of the music was pre-existing drum parts. Yeah. And you know, it was straight rock music. If the drum part was perfect, I, I didn't feel like, you know, I have to reinvent it to be egotistical. Yeah. I left it alone. But half the show, I got a blank piece of paper. Absolutely. So you had a chance to design your own parts. Got a chance to design my own parts. And Sonny was so great about letting me participate. And then sometimes, 
you know, there was a scene in a corny scene in a bar with a guy, you know, and I was like, well, it should sound like, you know, he hit the bossa nova button on an old Casio. Like, and, and they're like, he's like, well, turn on the electric thing, try it. And then the director started to laugh and he's like, keep that in, you know. <laughs> so just, and then we made up a metal double bass thing. So the creative part, I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of, of having the show and writing the book. Um, you know, you have to earn your way up to that. And for me, it took 15 years of subbing. But you know, we had, I had the chance to interview Andres here. He's doing Hamilton now. Yes. And that's an intense show for what that is. I know you've subbed for that. Mm -hmm. And we had Sonny in here mm -hmm. as you're doing the do up show with him. But Sonny's a fantastic piano player and a musical director mm -hmm. at what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So you're meeting some people that are really at a high level musically. And you've Absolutely. surrounded yourself with these like minded people. I think that's something which is very, very important that you're involved with these people and you're enjoying and learning simultaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, for one thing, if you learn a show and you sub a show, you know, you go in there. I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon where it's like Wile E. Coyote and the sheepdog and they're like blowing each other up with like dynamite and falling off a cliff. And then they're like, cut. And he's like, see you tomorrow, George. And like they walk out. It's like, like you just like, hey, how are you? And it's like, you're, in, you're, in you're like in battle on this Broadway stage. Like, you know, you, if you make one mistake, it's like, you know, the conductor's like, like so, you, you know, you don't know these lives chances that are crossing paths. Yeah. You know, I auditioned moving out with uh, this, I'm like, wow, this guy sounds really good. He sounds like he, when he talks, he has an Irish accent. I, it was Darren Holden from Ireland, mm. who's gone on to become, you know, basically pop star there. Yeah, yeah. And we tried out together and, you know, wow, our like lives, and we both worked equally as hard in our lives and we both tried to work our way up. And then, so when you, when you go out there and you're looking at these other people, you're looking at these stories of hard work yeah. and perseverance and dedication and, and if it's on Broadway you can rest assured that there's there's no there's no like you know oh it's just who you know <laughs> you, you have to work hard enough that you get to know some people but if you don't deliver the goods when you, your chance comes yeah. you're, it's over and you don't get a lot of chances here you get one that's really what it comes out to Alex Lackamore in, in an interview I think it was a modern drummer actually said you, you have to nail it the first time yeah and if you don't nail it in order to get a second chance, it has to be like abundantly clear to me that you will nail it the second time. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not mean and inhuman. So when I played Hamilton the first time, I mean, I was, I mean, if a doctor took my blood pressure, I probably would have been in the hospital. I was nervous. <laughs> and Alex, like, he could sense it was a little too on top. I was yeah. pushing, I was just, and I could tell too, you know, like the yeah. click, like, can it really be that fast? You know, <laughs> I played in the Heights with him a hundred times. He's like, just relax, man, you'll be back. It'll be fine, you know. Yeah. But that's that's part of you know the pressure that like I know is coming now, mm. and uh, and you really you really can't make mistakes. But you've gotten used to it now, so it's a part of it. It's a part of your act now in that Broadway mentality. Yeah, that it comes down to. Yeah, you do you do get used to it. It it doesn't it doesn't make it easier. Yeah. It's like you know if you're on the Yankees, you know it doesn't get easier in your tenth year to hit a hundred mile an hour fastball. Yeah, exactly right. If you start to like drop the ball. You know, if you've been around 10 years, you know, you probably get a couple of passes, but they're going to run out too, you yeah, know. So yeah. you, you, it's, you know, it's, if you want to, if your goal is to play with the big boys and girls, then that's where your, your level has to be. Absolutely. And you put your big boy pants on and you've maintained that at a high level. So that's really, really good. <laughs> Done my best. Let's talk about now education and, and teaching privately, which, mm -hmm. you, you, which you're still doing at a, at a, at a high level. Mm -hmm. And then you got involved in books, writing and publishing and editing. Right. So teaching, I, I've loved. I started teaching right when I started studying with you, which yeah. is, in, I guess, I was 19. So <laughs> that had to be in the early 90s. Yeah. I've loved teaching since then. And I, I've been very fortunate to have, you know, helped a lot of younger people who are now professional drummers. Yeah. Probably I would have to say my pride and joy is uh, Mark Juliana. Fantastic, fantastic and, player. Um, Mark's a pretty special person. Yeah. You know, to, to hear the way he plays now and to think I had anything to do with that is, is uh, and I know, you know, we have this like, line, you know, beautiful lineage, like you taught me, I taught him, and, you know, all the way down from the lineage you talk about, from mm -hmm. George Lawrence Stone yeah. and Sanford Moeller to Jim Chapin and Joe Morello, and, yeah, yeah. you know, if someday my name might be mentioned in that, like Absolutely. by somebody, you know, oh, you know, I saw Bergamini play down on Bleecker Street, and then I took some lessons from, it's uh, just an amazing thing to think about. You it's know? happening now. Yeah. The groundwork has been laid down, and you're doing it now, which is why I think this is an important interview for people to hear. The wide variety of things that you're doing, even getting down to, you know, now editing drum books and things. Maybe that collegiate mindset, I, I always uh, admired books. And then when you told me to go to PASIC, I, I just loved...
building a curriculum of yeah. books. You turned me on to a bunch, a bunch of the classics, a bunch of the modern books. And then I just started researching, like, oh, I can use Frankie Malibay book for Afro-Cuban. I can use this book for that. And, and then I started becoming a real fan and a collector of books. Right. And I always wanted to get published. It just seemed like, I, I sort of look at your career as like a multifaceted diamond. And when you're published, you know, you and I own a publishing company, and, and it's fun to do, and, and, and you, you can make money. You know, you're not going to, drum book publishing, you're not going to buy a new house with that money or anything. But, but there's, a, there's a credibility that comes with being published. And, you know, if you have something to say, you should say it. Absolutely. So I, I remember as a kid, I, when I would listen to Rush, I would follow along with that old Rush transcription book, and I, and I would be like, oh, that's how that looks. And so I, I started off by getting published with articles, Modern Drummer Magazine, yeah. uh, and then you asked me to uh, help you put okay. your book, It's Your Move, into a published form. Yeah. And again, I, I said, well, I don't really know how to do that. And you're <laughs> like, I, you can probably figure it out. And we figured it out. Well, you know, you have a, a specific skill. Like, as an architecture, th there's a certain sense of detail that you had that, yeah. that I saw. And I said, boy, if you can do that, you can do this. Yeah, that might also have to do with like my OCD, you know, like <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, but yeah, no, the, the, de the level of detail. So, so we did It's Your Move. And then, again, going to these trade shows, you know, now It's Your Move was published and it was with, at the time, Warner Brothers. Yeah. We went to dinner, you introduced me to people there. One of the guys there was about my age, Ray Bryce. We liked a lot of the same music. And then he said, hey, you want to do a Zeppelin book for us, or do you want to help out? So I, I got published, and I had probably about, uh, I don't know, six or seven books out. Uh, and then started to you know, talk to people at the companies about projects. So like, the transcription books that I got known for, they're, they're like projects that, they're, they're in a way not as hard to do. Like, I didn't have to write a new thesis. I, yeah. I, so I worked with these artists that I was interested in. Yeah. That interests publishers, because you can bring in these different people. Yeah. So over the course of time, I, again, was just networking at industry events, and I ran into an old keyboard player friend of mine, Chris Gialfa, who I'm still good friends with uh, to this day. He's a, a vice president, I believe, at Diodario. Mm -hmm. The time, he was in publishing for many years, has a top cover band in New Jersey, was uh, the vice president of sales at Carl Fisher. And he said, I see you have all these books out, we gotta do something together. <laughs> and he brought me over for an interview to be the drum editor at Carl Fisher. Like I've said many times in my life, I said, what's a drum editor? <laughs> and uh, they described what I was supposed to do, acquisitions and bring in it. And then the, the gentleman there, uh, who was the CEO, gave me a budget to do a DVD. And I, I hired somebody in LA. I flew out and did the DVD, and I learned on the job. I learned about royalties. I learned when people called me up and said, Joe, I haven't gotten a royalty check in six months or a year from Carl Fisher. What is going on? You know, they made a mistake. They didn't pay somebody. Then I learned, oh, wait, now I have to be like an artist relations. Absolutely. Type. And then, then do the business. What happened to, the, oh, this guy's file is lost. Get, you know, get something done within a company without ruffling feathers. Yeah. And, and, and my style is like pointing fingers is not, uh, you know, if, if you're talking to a friend and you know, you know somebody did something wrong, fine in private conversation, but there's no point in pointing fingers. And, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so then I became the drum editor for Carl Fisher. Um, I felt there were some things there that I, I wasn't necessarily happy about. I had idolized and admired Rob Wallace and Paul Siegel from DCI Music Video. For many years, they did Steve Gadd's first video, Simon Phillips' first video. Oh, you know. We interviewed Rob, and it's a fantastic interview for people to go by and watch mm -hmm. the Rob Wallace interview. Rob is, is a special just, guy. Oh, he's such a great yeah, guy. Yeah. I'm just so, you know, you know so I, I became the drum editor for Hudson Music, and I, I could not have, you know, picked a better place to land yeah you know just love those guys love the gig and I still do it more part-time now because the industry has changed a lot I had done a book with Jason Bittner with Carl Fisher and to this day Jason and I are still quite good friends great guy he was doing a clinic at the collective and he said Joe listen I got to do my DVD with Hudson music and I said of course you do they're the they're the best you know I don't no sweat I'm doing, a cl I'm doing a clinic at the Collective, come down. Rob and Paul, for those who don't know, also owned the Collective at that time. Yeah. And I went down and I saw them there. I didn't know them. I went up and introduced myself to them and I said who I was and what I did. And um, you know, I, I, I enjoy this you know, editing and the editorial side, yeah. but I, I feel like I might want to make a move. And I said, I can't imagine you'd ever need somebody like me, you, the best at what you 
producing drum education content in the world. But on the outside chance that you ever did, I just thought I'd introduce myself. <laughs> they looked at each other and Paul said to me, I can still remember exactly what he said. He said, you know, it's nice to meet you, Joe. It's funny you should say that. We're thinking of growing the company. Why don't you send us a resume? Absolutely. Like I went out and saw the clinic and, and he said, so I went home, made a resume. <laughs> I learned on the job, you know, and then I sent it in and, and they brought me on board and then it was like trial by fire because they had a million things going on. And they had a million things, but you ended up working with some fantastic people in the course of that. But you had the chance to work with Neil Peart. Just tell that story real quickly. So when I got the job with Hudson Music, I knew that Neil had done videos with Rob and Paul before. He had two, two DVDs out before. And I also know from being a Rush fan that he's... Uh, extremely private. He's a very shy person, doesn't go to any industry events. You know, it really bums me out because I think yeah. he would inspire a lot of people. Absolutely. But he's, he's a very private guy. So I never even mentioned his name. You know, I was like this, I'm, I'm working with Steve Gadd here. I'm working with, you know, <laughs> Gadd came actually later, but you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> so one day Rob said, you know, we just happened to be with Neil and he seems like he might be ripe to do a project. Um, Neil's the kind of person, like, he would approach doing an educational project like a, the band would do a record. Like, right. in the early days, you know, you, you just have to keep the, feeding the machine. But once you reach a certain level, like, you know, you need to be engaged to want to do a project. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I don't know, I'm not afraid of saying this on video. Um, I've always dreamed of doing a book with Simon Phillips. <laughs> and I've, now we've talked to Simon about it. And he, he's like, you know, We'll do it. Just we gotta wait for the right time. He's got it, you know. Simon, he just left Toto. Now he's focused on protocol, you know. But hopefully someday, Simon is at the top. He's got to want to devote a few months of his life to go through this idea that we had. Right. And hopefully, that, so Neil was ripe for this. But of course, he's, you know, they couldn't just bring me down to introduce me to him because mm -hmm. they just needed to make sure that he would be comfortable. So they asked me to write a proposal for him, which I did. And then they went back and forth with him until he basically thought that he would, it was in, interesting enough for him that he would want to take it to the next step. Yeah. And then Rob said, well, maybe you should, you know, you should meet Joe just to see how it feels. We went to a Rush concert and, and um, I met Neil, you know, we went on his bus and I met him and <laughs> I nearly had a heart attack. I mean, he was, he was you got to understand, he was like Mickey Mantle to me. Yeah, Joe DiMaggio, John F. Kennedy, I, you know, and then, um, you know, I could tell when I first met him, you know, he, he, he really is a very private, kind of quiet guy. And, you know, for once in my life, I, I, my father's voice was ringing in my ear, you know, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all that. But I stayed quiet for a while. And then finally, he, um, he was talking about architecture, believe it or not, because he's a brilliant person. Yeah. And um, he was riding his motorcycle blueprint. And, 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 and he, I, you know, I popped into the conversation. Rob and him were catching up, all like old friends. And I said, you know, no, that Michael Graves building you saw, whatever it was. And he was like, yeah, that, that, that's it, right. And then, and then at some point he said, oh, sound check time. We have to show Joe the drums. And then I was, I mean, he brought me at sta on stage, which when you met him, we did the same thing. Same thing. Brought me on stage, sat me behind the drums. And Rob had said, don't mention the project. Don't bring it up. Like, you know, Rob gave me a little coaching. <laughs> just, just relax, just meet him. Just, you know, I'm like, yes, boss, yes, boss. Uh, and so then anyway, we went on stage, uh, sat behind the drums. And then we went downstairs and we talked about other things and I found, you know, you know, some things he talked about that I was interested in other yeah, things. And, yeah. and, you know, one thing that's so funny is not that I have any inkling what it's like to, to have that kind of a name where when he goes to the airport, there's people waiting. But one of the things that, that I know people have said to him is like, we have so much in common. And, you know, I, and people know you as a public figure. How do you know we have so much in common? Yeah, exactly. How do you know? You really don't. Like you don't really know. And he's, you know, I admire with you. You'll be at the Nam show. You're like an, you're like an island in the sea of people who just want to. And you, you just know how to uh, open yourself up to people, and give them access to you. Yeah. That you have a gift that's just. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> and Neil was not given that gift. He has different gifts. Yeah. Anyway, we hung out, and then at the end of the, that meeting, he uh, he said, well, "I'm looking forward to working with you at, at um, on the project," yeah. and it was just it was just so great. And then from there, we did the, we did uh, a DVD called "Taking Center Stage," mm -hmm. and um, we filmed the talking bits in Death Valley National Park. And you can see me on there asking him questions. Yeah. I really was shocked that it all went down. He knew I was in the tribute band, 
And I thought for sure he's going to be, this guy's a freak. I don't want you know, a fan <laughs> near me, you know? And there's a scene in the DVD where I said, you know, I think Free Will's one of the hardest Rush songs to play on drums. <laughs> and it's on the DVD and he goes, it is for me. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, we've we become pretty good friends. Uh, I had lunch with him last week actually, and he, uh, he's doing quite well. He's retired from, from playing now. One of the things that we did get to do was also a companion book, also called Taking Center Stage. And I, uh, it was a, dr a dream project of mine. I wanted to do a retrospective on his career. Yeah. I transcribed all the songs. We published it in color, and you know, I remember being at a Rush concert and walking up to the merchandise booth and seeing my book there. And uh, it's a fantastic book, and the fact that you've had this relationship with Neil, this this you know, idol. I mean, we, and I use that term very carefully. I mean, he, he really in your life, he was really at that level yeah. where you, and again, following your dream mm -hmm. and being passion driven, led you to that relationship with Neil. That is huge. It's just so funny. I just have to say, like, there it wasn't a goal. I would would have loved to have met him but to have a goal like you can't manipulate life like that yeah yeah you know and i so i, I just let it go and life just it just worked out that way you know yeah, absolutely there's a, there's a line in there's a line in uh, lewis carroll uh he was part of my dream but then i was part of his dream too yeah you know yeah, that's absolutely. how i feel about and it. that's how it worked out for sure yeah talk about drum guru and the artists that you worked there briefly Along the line with Hudson Music, Rob Wallace approached me about um, creating an app, educational app for drummers, and we did it. It's uh, Drum Guru, and you can see video, and there's notation there. So it's another different way. Books are now digital, as we know, and yeah. um, the paper book still has a place. DVDs essentially gone away, mm. so video is online, places like Drumeo. And in Drum Guru, the video is uh, married to notation. It goes by with a cursor. Rob, you know, with his great uh, network of artists and educators has put together a fantastic, you know, lineup in, in that project. And he brought me in at the beginning, so I was part of the development of it. It was fantastic. On that project, I got to work with some of the people that I didn't get to work with at Hudson. That would include Chad Smith yeah. and Mike Portnoy and Steve Gadd. Yeah. How powerful. Steve Gadd, that was another moment. I, I don't, you know, I know you're very close <laughs> to Steve. I don't know him that well. We only met him a couple of times. But the drum guru shoot with Steve Gadd, um, there's a a whole series of closing lessons where he plays threes. And he, you know, he's done that a lot, but I, I was getting thrown off by the fill he plays uh, in Love for Sale on Burning for Buddy yeah. in the drum break. Yeah. And uh, basically that whole series of lessons was him giving me a private lesson on explaining. <laughs> I, I, I just was thrown by where he started it. Yeah. And just let me say about Steve Gadd, like for whatever I know about drumming, he, if you know the Buddy break in Love for Sale, Bow, bow, mm, ah, yeah. uh, and then you know he plays his singles and then he does that, <laughs> ends it there with that space. Yep. So Gad plays bow, bow, do, 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 mm, go. <laughs> so so you have to know the art form. You have to know Buddy and Gad to understand what a genius Gad was for doing that. He played his vocabulary, but in the repetitive way of Buddy and and quoted Buddy just on the last two notes with the spit. It's like, this is why he's a genius. Absolutely. You know? this, is, this is the brilliance of Steve Gadd. In that subtle measure of how he plays that, he was able to completely define Gadd's sound mm -hmm. and playing mm -hmm. in paying great tribute to Buddy. Mm -hmm. And to hear that and listen to it is a, a study in itself. Oh. And that's the brilliance of Steve Gadd. Here I am sitting with him at the power station or wherever we did that. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, man, no, it's just, it's like threes. You know, do, you, you know, do it with me, do it with me. Like this is went on before the shoot. And I'm like, you know, and then he, I was like, can we do this on camera? You know, and I'm, I'm like, Steve Gadd. So yeah, that was just, that was just ridiculous. Oh, fantastic. That really is fantastic. Just really talk about now with publishing books and being involved with publishing now as we run a company, what that entails. So one of the things I, I also want to say is that um, as my teacher, you know, you, you would have been important in my life anyway, but. We have wonderful friendship. You were in my wedding, and uh, we've been there for all of our family's uh, you know, happy and sad events yeah, through all, all these years. Yeah. We broke this big rule in life: never start a business <laughs> with your friends. But we did it anyway. We started Wisdom Media, you know, working as comp complements to each other. Yeah. And so, through that, it's it's nice having a different perspective on uh, owning and steering the company now, because yeah. now we just choose which projects yeah, come in. And then, you know, the industry, let's face it, has gotten smaller, so we choose 
how to execute the project. Would it be physical or should it be digital only? Yeah. And you know, evaluate the numbers as they come in. It's funny, you know, in, in, I was having this talk with someone. If you play music for a living or you, anything else you do, eventually you get money. Yeah. And then you become an entrepreneur, whether you admit to it or not. Absolutely. And some people have to have somebody to handle it for them, and that's fine. But I actually noticed that some people enjoy it, and I know you do, and I enjoy it. Yeah. Steering that ship and trying to figure out what to do. You, you said something to me uh, in, actually, I heard you say it at a clinic, and you said, you said, think about my life. First, I play the drums, and then I get paid. <laughs> you know, so I kind of feel like it's fun to run this business and, it really is. and, and um, figure out where we're going to go with it. So I'm still working with Hudson Music, but we have a, this business, Wisdom, distributed by Alfred, who's the, one of the biggest distributors of educational books in the world, along with Hal Leonard. What's great is it's apolitical, and we're able to accommodate all these different authors. Yeah. Hudson Music has big stars. Mm. We have worthy people who are in our orbit who Absolutely. deserve to be published. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but it makes me happy that we can do that. <laughs> Absolutely, and the digital version on HudsonMusic.com allows yes. that, that different type of, of, of understanding print music, what we have with Alfred, and or the digital side with Hudson. It really works out really, really well, right. the good balance. And, and I have to say also, you know, it's all relationships. Yeah. We, have, we still have a very good relationship with Alfred, our friend Dave Black there. Yeah. Dave, Dave is a, a huge important person in the world of publishing. And a brilliant mind in publishing, absolutely. Dave and Rob Wallace and Paul Siegel were, all were mentored, mentored by Sandy Feldstein. Yeah. You know, Alfred wasn't, they weren't really too enthused or, or about doing our digital stuff, so we said, can we do it with Hudson? Because yeah. Rob is. Yeah. Here we, we've broken all the rules, and we're, not, we're doing it just all out of just good relationships absolutely. and trust and fully open. And honesty, you know, just just being, we, we, there, there's nothing's ever done in any like, oh, you know, we're, maybe we'll make this deal with. We Alfred didn't want to do it, so now we get to work with everybody, yeah. and it's just a beautiful, you know, cooperative effort. Now, of course, you know, look, if you're if you're endorsing products, I play Tama drums. Mm -hmm. You know, the only time I wouldn't wouldn't have a Tama kit is if I get somewhere and they they have a cards company that just does not have any Tama yeah, drums, and absolutely. then those guys understand I have to. Absolutely, but that's different. You know, with an endorsement, that's your uh, integrity of playing the product. My endorsements are like all the stuff that I played as a kid, except for Sabian, which you turned me on to, <laughs> and then I realized they sounded better, so I, I bought Sabians. Yeah. I sold all my Zildjians, I bought all Sabians, and then eventually it led to an endorsement. But Tama, you know, and LP and the other companies I've been with for a long time. And Absolutely. It's so powerful to see all those, it's relationship, relationship, relationship. Mm -hmm. Then when you got involved with Sabian and heading their Sabian Education Network and managing that program, bringing all these teachers in, mm -hmm. that was a whole other fantastic level of what's happening. So it builds, it builds, it builds. But here's what's interesting. You found the balance of this artistic level that you're maintaining a high artistic level. You maintain this high business level because we're doing all these projects together, which is monetizing our artistic level. Mm -hmm. And then there's the personal side. You've got a beautiful family with two beautiful children. Kim is fantastic that you've been able to balance that trilogy of intensity, which is going so great. Thank you. In closing, I want you to think about this next generation that's out there. Young musicians, and you're a great example of doing all of these different things that are allowing you to have a life in the music industry and balance all this and have great fun in it, performing and business. What would you say to this, this next generation of what they can prepare themselves for making a living in the music industry and living their dream. I think if you want to do music for a living going forward, that you need to have some mix of all these skills that we've spoken about today. Mm -hmm. I think you need to be a player at a very, very high level. And, and let me say that there's no worries about that. I mean, I have young students that are playing. You know, I have a student that just played me his audition for Berkeley. He's playing, uh, was it Cosmic Debris or Zombie Woof? Yeah. One of those Zappa tunes, maybe both. But nailed perfectly. Yeah. Um, his name is Jonathan, in case he watches this. And um, just the, the level of playing has gotten, has gotten so high with the people. Who, so I, I, you know, I think people need, you need to know that there are people who are so devoted to this and working so hard that your playing has to be a super high level. It's, it seems to me that if you want to increase the chances of success, everyone wants to get into that huge band. Yeah. That's a big basket, and, and you, if you want to try to shoot for that when you're young, shoot for it. Put your eggs in it, and then people might want to get a Broadway show. That's a Broadway show. You can make a good living, and that could be your job. Yeah. Unfortunately, they close. Yeah. <laughs> some, do, some last forever, like Hamilton will probably last forever, yeah. but some don't last forever. So those Easter eggs you know, that'll keep you working forever, they're not easy to attain, and 
some of them, you know, it's, it's, there's a very high level of chance that goes yeah. in yeah. and an extremely high level of competition. So if you want to have a chance for success at it, you know, you, I think you need to hone all the other skills that are going to go around your playing. Right. It's a given that your playing has to be at a high level. If, if you can compose a few sentences yeah. and with properly typed out, you might, when someone sends a book proposal to somebody at a company, now that I'm on the other side of the desk, so to speak, <laughs> yeah. if, if their words are spelled wrong and it's all not punctuated right and they want to write a book, <laughs> you know, so you, you need these other skills, I think are very important. Learn some business, because even if, if you run a teaching practice or you run a wedding band or you run you know, a little publishing company for yeah. music or for books, you need those skills. So I, I think all of that stuff, and you just have to love it. Yeah. And you have to love it. I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm fully in this boat, but I've heard, I don't remember who said it, maybe you do. Someone said, if, if you're thinking about music and there's, there's something else that you like just as much, do that. <laughs> because it, you, you need to really devote your, your life to it. I mean, yeah. the most of my waking hours in my middle and high school days were spent, if, if I was not in school or asleep, playing the drums. Yeah. You know, I, I stayed home from so many social things to practice, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, so having all, the, all, all those skills. And, I mean, if I was going to give one other piece of real super concrete advice, I think there's a little bit of a, a disconnect. If you're going to go to college for it, just, you know, think about what you ultimately want to do. Yeah. Try not to get yourself $100,000 in debt when you're going to come out into this business because it's, you know, it's a slow climb. You know, I started out with the $50 gigs and, mm. and a few students. But having said all that, if, if you're a great player and you love it <laughs> and you have those business skills, you know, pursue your dream. You know, the industry is changing. Uh, I know the models for making money are, are, are different. Happily, you know, I've, I've been able to pull it off and uh, I don't see why the next group shouldn't be able to do it. So, <laughs> and thank you for having me. This has been fantastic. <laughs> thank you're you, Joe. You are totally committed. You are passionate. You're doing all the right things because your reputation in this industry is fantastic. People love that. Because of all of that, I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>